very excited to introduce our uh, speakers for today. We have Doug and Mike with the NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador Program. And uh, go ahead and take it away. All right, good morning, everybody, or I should say good afternoon. This is afternoon. And uh, just welcome to uh, our talk. It's about the Fermi Paradox. And so definitely want to, uh, we'll explain what, what that's all about in just a few minutes. But first I want to tell you a little bit about um, Raleigh Astronomy Club. Uh, Mike, Keith and I are both members of Raleigh Astronomy Club. Mike is actually one of our co-chairs and I'm uh, the club Alcor, which means I am the Ast Astronomical League coordinator for people who actually do submit award uh, information to, the, to our parent organization. But I just want to say a few words about Astronomy Club uh, and membership. Um, if you feel that you have a passion inside of you for astronomy, for the stars, uh, you know, you don't have to be an egghead. You don't have to know any, any math and you don't have to own a telescope. It, you just have that common passion where you feel like I want to learn something more about this. It, this is a great club for you. I myself, when I was uh, younger, uh, felt that same passion, that same gnawing urge inside. I just got to know something more about the night sky. I just don't know how to go about it. I joined the Raleigh Astronomy Club really knowing nothing about the night sky. And, you know, uh, here it is 22 years later, I've learned so much. And it's all because of the club actually nurturing that passion for me. So if you're looking for a place to nurture your passion for, the, for astronomy, the Raleigh Astronomy Club is for you. And so we do hope you'll try to, you know, reach out to us. You can go out to our, our webpage at raleighastro.org. Uh, we do, uh, when we're not under um, uh, yeah, social distancing uh, regulations, we do meet at the NCSU Craft Center every second Friday. And all of our meetings are free and open to the public. And that also includes our virtual meetings. So feel free to look us up. You can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Look us up and we'll definitely be glad to welcome you in. And we'd love to love to have you come and, and be a member and join us. All right. After this. So that's my plug for the club. We'll go ahead, Mike. You want to say something? Yep. Doug, uh, I think uh, if you want to hit uh, screen sharing, you can. I don't think we're seeing Thanks. your slides yet. No worries. Okay, we'll do that again. So uh, I will start with my uh, introduction of, uh, with my friend, Doug. Uh, Doug uh, is a uh, retired senior project manager, um, graduated from NCSU, uh, Go Pack, um, and has been in very, very active in National Observing Awards. So he mentioned that with Alcor, uh, the Astronomical League, um, these are all the different uh, types of awards. Think of it as a um, almost like a Boy Scout, um, you, know, uh, you know, what do you call them, patches merit badge. or merit badges. Thank you. Uh, and it's a great approach to learning astronomy and actually then continuing your journey. Um, uh, but Doug has definitely been quite involved. Uh, 22 years with the uh, club, 14 years uh, as a co-chair, um, six years as the Alcor, um, former member of the uh, Astronomical Society of uh, the Pacific Northwest, uh, NASA Night Sky Network. Uh, Doug, I think you're on your second year as a NASA JPL I am. Uh, the ambassador um, and just very, very involved in, in the program. So um, that is Doug and a good friend of mine, good observing uh, partner. Exactly. And uh, so I'll just uh, transition quickly over to you, Mike. Uh, again, as Mike said, he's a, Mike's a great observing partner. He's full of knowledge and I learn a lot from him as well. Uh, Mike is currently a finance accounting uh, professional for GlaxoSmithKline, um, and he actually attended University of Florida. Uh, my wife and I actually were down there uh, many years actually before Mike, and so that's a great, great college if you guys are thinking about going there. But of go course, give, yeah, go Gators and, and go Pack. So if, you're, uh, if you can't get down to Florida, go to North Carolina State University. <laughs> uh, he's a you know, fl former uh, Pack Club uh, Cub Master for Pack 312. Um, he's also been, uh, you know, a former treasurer, uh, actually Mike is finance. He's really, uh, he's uh, quite adept at, at all that. Uh, and Mike himself has a number of national observing awards. This slide's a little old cause I know that Mike has actually gotten a lot more, uh, awards since then. And he's, uh, he's re remained active in, uh, in doing, uh, observing awards. Well, I will put a plug in for the AL. If this is really one of the best ways to learn the night sky is to participate in national observing awards. And that's something that's really easy. We have some that start off at novice, 
begin um, immediate, intermediate, and, and advanced. So you don't have to, you know, again, know everything all at once. These are programs are designed to help you learn. And uh, Mike has certainly uh, learned quite a bit uh, over the years himself. Um, he is a current uh, Raleigh Astronomy Club co-chair. Um, he's been that for six years. Um, he's also a, a, a volunteer coordinator. Um, he's also, uh, we have a, a, our key master, which is, holds the, uh, the key set uh, for, our, for our observing site. Um, a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador. Mike, how many years have you been? Have you been uh, an ambassador? Since 2018. All right, so yeah, that's great. That's a number, quite a few years here, three years at least, right? So that's great. And then, uh, of course, um, one of the really cool things, Mike is a uh, statewide Star Party Racket coordinator along with me, and that's a really important program that we hope to see kick off this year, although it may be virtual. So that's, that's Mike, our other presenter, and I think you're going to really uh, enjoy uh, the portions of this talk that he, uh, he presents to you. So let's get right into it. Um, you know, when we talk, start talking about, you know, extraterrestrial life, uh, where's it at, what's happening with it, you know, there's just some fundamental questions we all ask ourselves. And that one is, are we alone in the universe? Uh, is there anybody really out there? And if so, why aren't they returning our calls? Um, and then, you know, if you, if you question these things, you have these questions, you're not alone. You, you, we all in the astronomy club, had these questions ourselves. We're constantly pouring over the sky at night uh, to uh, not only observe beauty, but other signs of life if we, if we can find them. So it's, it's uh, you know, you're not alone if you have those, those really uh, you know, questions, those deep questions and you're asking them yourselves. I wanna talk a little bit now about the Fermi paradox. So there's two pieces of this. Who was Enrico Fermi? This is the, and then what's a paradox? So I'm real briefly, um, all of us have benefited from the existence of Enrico Fermi. He, fortunately, he passed away in, uh, on 28th of November, 1954, but he was one of the architects of the atomic bomb he issued in the nuclear age. But the thing that really um, uh, we all benefit from is he was also the designer of the nuclear reaction for nuclear reactors for generating power. So we all benefit directly from from his existence on the earth and from his intellect. So um, one of the things that Fermi did was he did ask um, a particularly intriguing question and it's called the Fermi paradox and it's about the existence of alien life in the universe. So that's who Enrico Fermi was. So now you know who Fermi is. Now we'll just talk a little bit about a paradox. So a paradox is really just a statement or a question that may seem contradictory. But when it's explained, it makes sense. For instance, save money by spending it. Now, for all the people who spent money on games, uh, uh, on, the, on the video games and on, and on GameStop uh, over the last few weeks, they know that they, by spending their money, they are actually saving it because now those, those initial investments have really grown. So that's how we explain a paradox, saving money by spending it. Of course, anyone who owns GameStop, uh, GameStop stock knows what that means. Um, and then the, I'll talk about the very last one, deep down you're really shallow. Now you might've actually heard this probably on a last date with somebody before you were actually dumped. <laughs> so, you know, again, you, you know, deep down, well, really, where are you at? Well, there's nothing there, you're just shallow. So this is how we explain a paradox. And Fermi's paradox was, was uh, cast in a similar way. If there are so many opportunities for life in our galaxy, then, where are all the aliens? As we're talking about that, um, he, Fermi was interested in knowing what alien civilization might look like. And today, NASA is actually using many of these models that Fermi came up with. And so he, he cast um, societies and, and, and alien life into three categories. And it really had to do with energy and how they're using energy. Now we're putting out probes to look at solar systems and exosolar planets to see, is there basically garbage and pollution in their atmosphere? Are they actually using energy? So this is really what we wanna first begin looking like if we're going to recognize where um, alien life is. So there's a type one civilization. That's sort of like where we are. That's, that's you know, a, pla a planet that's actually able to totally use all of its energy. Now we're, we're not quite there yet because we still can't really harness all the energy on our earth, but we're working towards that, you know? A type two civilization might be 
a civilization that can actually harness the power of its entire sun. Right now, the Earth only receives about one three sixtieth of the sun's light, and that's and we don't, we're not even using that efficiently. But a an alien civilization might be able to build something like a Dyson sphere, which is basically a big structure that goes around their their sun and actually harvests all of its power at once. So that'd be a lot of power that it was able to generate. And we thought we saw something like that earlier, a few years ago, but found out that it was really just a set of asteroids that were firmly placed around a, around a star system. And then a type three civilization might be so strong that they can actually harness the entire energy of a galaxy. Would, that would be fantastic power, power that we couldn't really imagine at this time. So that's kind of the idea of what an alien civilization might look like. And then, uh, and then to kind of sub supplement that, they came up with an equation called the Drake equation, which we're going to have Mike uh, talk to us a little bit about. Take yeah. Away, Mike. Yeah. So this was uh, postulated by uh, Dr. Frank Drake. Uh, and as he puts it, it was right at the evening of the first conference for SETI, uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And he was trying to figure out, so, you know, what are we going to do? So he basically put together this, all, all these factors that should come into play in terms of trying to understand what's the potential, what's the probability for life. Uh, so the first thing we do is we basically look at, you know, how many stars are there? And that's what this equation starts uh, right there where Doug is uh, showing. So um, what they're really trying to look at is, you know, how many stars are there um, in our galaxy? Um, and then you start to add these additional factors. So what's the fraction that have planets? Then of those, uh, how many of those planets um, might be able to support life? And then if they can support life, does life actually happen? And then if life actually happens, so again, life could be just a single cell organism, but how about intelligent life? Um, and then um, once you then do the next factor, what uh, percentage of that intelligent life form can actually um, send that signal that they're here um, from uh, into outer space? So if we think about the Earth, for example, we've only been able to send out signals, radio signals since the 1930s. So even though we've been around and there have been many civilizations here on Earth even prior to that, um, We've only been able to communicate um, for the last 90 years. And then we even go to what sort of length or time frame do we have uh, where we are in that communicating um, part. So if we try and even apply that to Earth today, you know, how much longer are we going to be at this state? You hear a lot of people talk about we're destroying our Earth, we're destroying our environment. And if we end up doing that, what's that going to mean for us? So again, how long does an average civilization uh, stay in that kind of intelligent communicating um, portion? Um, and again, think that our galaxy has been around for so many billions and billions of years, uh, well over 10 billion years. Um, and we've only been communicating for 90 and how much longer are we going to go? So again, this sort of equation then uh, postulates, then this is the number of civilizations, uh, uh, you know, extraterrestrial civilizations that are communicating at one point in time. And there's no right or wrong answer with that. <laughs> exactly. Because it does change. These factors do change uh, with, dis with discovery. And, and, and so I just, believe, uh, just real quick, just, I believe that um, the folks uh, from the museum are going to email um, a, either it's a link to an Excel document or a Google Drive document where you can actually play around and put in your own values uh, for that. So that should be coming out. Yeah, it's a pretty cool little interactive equation um, that Mike's put together for everyone to play with. So that will be really cool. All right. So as Mike was talking about, the probability of life, you know, our galaxy has been in existence for billions of years. Our little solar system's only been in, in existence for about 3.4 billion. So the galaxy's actually had a much, much longer time for life to develop elsewhere, hopefully evolve into a space-faring uh, civilization so it can communicate with us. And if you didn't notice from Mike's talk about the Drake equation, part of that is, can the, the civilization actually communicate? It doesn't matter whether or not, you know, it's, it, it exists and it's, it's intelligent. Is it do they have the ability to communicate or have they had the ability to develop space technology? That's the only way that we'd actually be able to note 
that they were there. I did, uh, this is a kind of a simulation of our own galaxy. Uh, this is not an actual picture of it, but we live in the spiral bar galaxy. And we're roughly about two thirds of the way out from that uh, galactic core, which is, and sitting in a really calm place for the development of life. We're actually kind of between the Orion Spur and the Sagittarius Arm. And so it's a very quiet place. If you look where all these little red areas are, um, that's where there's a lot of star activity. Some stars are blowing up and other stars are forming. And so that's very violent. So that any planets that would be around a system like that would probably be obliterated by the blast. So uh, we're in a really quiet place though, nothing uh, happening. So it's a little boring, but it's a perfect place for life. Um, and we're beginning to look for that. So there, again, with there being billions of stars in the galaxy, lots of places in between these spiral arms for the development of life, you know, and some of these civilizations may have been able to develop interstellar travel, uh, even at the slow pace that we currently envision the way we're developing interstellar tra travel, there's been literally millions of years for other societies and other uh, populations to grow up, flourish, and develop that, that spacefaring uh, technology. And, and there, again, and there's many uh, stars that are similar to the suns that are billions of years older than our own sun. So if that's the case, if we have all that wonderful opportunity for life, then where are all the aliens? And this is the Fermi paradox. All right, so let's go to the next one. So in order to explain that, because it does seem contradictory that we have all this, all this ability for life, yet we don't seem to see it out there. And so Fermi came up with this idea of a great filter. This is why we can't see the life out there. And filters can either, a great filter can either, is an event or a condition that prevents the development or advancement of life, or a great filter could hasten the extinction of life. And so we're going to talk about some of the great filters, some of the things that could prevent life from actually developing, developing into a spacefaring technology, or also really quite possibly is something that could actually hasten the extinction of life on a planet like ours. All right, and so what we'd like to do is first of all, talk about great filters that we have passed. There is possibility if we look at the earth, we do have life. So we have passed some of those great filters. And so we'll have Mike talk about some of those great filters that we've passed. Yep. So as uh, Doug noted on that particular um, view of the galaxy, um, you know, it was very, very explosive, especially early on. And we're lucky enough now to be in a place where it is nice and, and calm. Um, but it is possible that uh, we are now at a point where things in general have just now calmed down, cooled off, and it's just now getting to the point where it can allow life. Um, there are many, many different types of stars. And uh, if you're in one of those active star formation areas, there's a lot of radiation. There's just a lot of commotion. Um, so there are, you know, that, that star formation could actually prevent um, the possibility of planets forming and, and life uh, being, uh, you know, life arising on a planet. An organization of the solar system is also very, very important for life. So, you know, we talk a lot about the Goldilocks zone. So, you know, basically where it's not too hot, not too cold, water, uh, uh, or basically H2O is in its liquid form. So water can form. And, you know, even on our own scenario uh, of, of this solar system, we've got basically Venus at one edge, Mars, Mars at the other edge, and Earth is nice and situated right in the middle. But many of the extra uh, solar systems that we see have a lot of the gas giants close into our um, own solar system. So that organization is very, very important. Um, and a lot of them will kick out those rocky planets as they, they move in. So again, you know, you don't want those, uh, those uh, ice giants or those gas giants near and close. Um, they'll, they'll kick them out. Also, if we go to the next uh, slide, uh, then we've got, um, you know, if you're much too close to, this, uh, to your host uh, star, uh, or it's a very big star, you might have too much radiation, uh, or you may have too much water or no modern water. And if you don't even have the right type of st uh, star, you might be lacking 
the heavier metals um, that are required or those complex uh, molecules that are required for life as we know it. And that's important as we know it. Um, this is another uh, form of the Drake equation that was put together by uh, Dr. Callis. Um, and he went through something similar, took the number of stars in our galaxies, so, and did a whole bunch of other additional uh, fractions. So, but just to touch on a few of those, in other words, did we have a high metal star? So in other words, a star that is more than just um, helium um, and um, hydrogen, excuse me, <clears throat> is the temperature just right? Do we have those, again, rocky planets in the habitable zone? Is there a stable spin uh, for that planet uh, and in the right orbit? A lot of people don't really realize this, but without our own moon um, to help stabilize our spin, it, uh, we had about a five hour uh, rotation period at the, at the very, very early uh, formation of the earth. That moon has helped stabilize um, our, our spin as it moves out uh, and it's also very, it's also responsible for the moon and tides. And if you think about all the tides and that uh, exchange of um, all the important things in our oceans, um, minerals and, and everything, it's uh, those tides help uh, create those, um, uh, you know, th those cycles that are very, very important for life. And our earth has an iron core and it has a magnetic field. So if you look at all these different things that you know, any one of those could have prevented uh, you know, intelligent life, although uh, intelligent is in quotes, intelligent life here on earth from forming. All right, awesome job, Mike. So that's, that's one of the, Mike has just talked about some of the filters that we've passed, some of those things that, that <clears throat> You know, have prevented life uh, from forming. If you if you fall out of any of those, you, most likely that you don't have life forming on uh, on a planet. I don't know if you noticed that last slide, but at the very bottom, uh, the total number is one, one Earth. So it's 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 very unlikely. You know, even with some of the uh, advancements in understanding that there are other planets, so that can actually support again, as Mike said, life as we know it. So. And I just want to kind of talk about some of those, you know, like, for instance, the water worlds hypothesis. You know, this is a great filter for worlds that are, are completely uh, encased in water, that are they're only water, and they may be actually covered by a really thick uh, mantle of ice. So, uh, it, and, and I will just point out that we have Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa as water worlds that actually um, orbit Jupiter, uh, they may very well have life in them. And, uh, but it's so dark, you know, there's no, there's no photosynthesis. You don't have land for creatures to emerge from and to begin, you know, uh, working with, with elements that are outside the water. In our own world, we have um, uh, living organisms that don't uh, use photosynthesis. You know, plants um, actually have on earth actually have to derive uh, you know, energy from the sun. They convert that into sugars and they live off those. But deep down off the coast of the United States uh, in the Caribbean, we have um, creatures that actually live off of chemosynthesis. This is actually chemicals in the water. We have volcanic vents off, uh, off the coast of the, many of the Caribbean islands. And deep down, we have these, these creatures over here on the left that we call tube worms. They're actually living organisms that don't ever see the light of day. So there's no chance for them to live off of photosynthesis, but uh, they do get uh, derived energy from the chemicals in the water. But if you can look uh, at, let's say, even a, a world that's full, full of tube worms, so this is really not what we would call intelligent life. Plus two, being in the water, you really are uh, completely underwater. You don't have the ability to manage chemical, chemical reactions that we would use to actually develop a spaceship. And you can't really develop electrical currents and stuff to actually create radio and TV and other types of communication devices to communicate outside of that world. So a water world does present a filter. It doesn't prevent the life from happening, but it does prevent the life from progressing. So water worlds, and we are going, we are sending probes to Europa, Ganymede and, and Callisto you know, to look for life the possibility of life, because one of NASA's uh, charges is to follow the water, and water is definitely a possibility for, for any life form to exist. 
All right. And then I, just to show you that there's also just recently, they actually created these ET or actually not created, but found ET sponges living off the coast of Hawaii. This was actually a 2019 discovery. Um, and so it's really quite interesting. Uh, they do look a little, little like ET, but this is a brand new life form that we found on, uh, on, uh, on our own earth. These could certainly be something like this might exist on another water world planet. That doesn't mean that the water world planet can't have uh, uh, intelligent life uh, in the sense of, of an octopus, you know, in compared to humans, humans have about roughly 3 billion neurons um, in their brains and uh, octopus have um, uh, literally about 1 billion neurons. So they are, have a similar level of intelligence and their but their intelligence is distributed. So they actually, each one of their tentacles actually operates as a separate autonomous brain itself. So overall, the octopus itself is an intelligent life form that lives completely under the water. It doesn't surface like we have mammals like dolphins and whales and stuff like that that have similar brain sizes to humans. This is a creature that has a similar kind of intelligence, yet it never, it never has to breathe uh, air or anything like that. So there could be something like that on a water world. Let's go to the next one. Um, then you could have a civilization living uh, say as uh, like the Egyptians or the Babylonians and ancient Persians or the Greeks or even the Roman Empire. Now these were incredibly advanced societies. In fact, many of our laws still come to us from the Roman Empire and our systems of thought come from people like Socrates, Plato, Neo-Platoism, philosophy, all come, still come to us from ancient Greek. And of course, with ancient Greece and, uh, and the ancient Babylonians, there is, of course, num num numeric systems, trigonometry, advanced uh, uh, ways of looking at, uh, at the cosmos. However, again, despite their great intelligence, they were unable to uh, communicate with mankind. So again, this, this is a filter until they're actually able to develop you know, space-seeking technologies they're kind of the filter actually prevents them from actually communicating elsewhere. So that's an example of where we could have advanced life sitting on a planet, but not be able to communicate uh, with it. All right. So that's filters that have lied in the, uh, lie in the past. Now we want to talk a little bit about what are the things that maybe for earth, now that we've passed all those, all those filters, what are the things that lie ahead for us? What are our challenges with advancing as a, as a spacefaring society? And Mike, I think you've got the next slide. Yep. yep. So, uh, you know, is it in our nature uh, of intelligent um, beings to destroy life itself? Um, we have harnessed the power of the atom. Um, and, you know, who knows uh, what we could do? Uh, you know, I can imagine uh, if there is a intelligent species out there that comes by and says, hey, wow, they've harnessed the power of the atom. And they get a little closer and look, oh, but they've made them in the warheads and they're pointing them at themselves. Yeah, that's a hard pass. We'll go on to the next place. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's always possible. Um, so again, we have the power to destroy ourselves. Uh, additionally, there could be other great filters that lie in front of us. And, you know, we always think about does uh, nature find a way to combat us? We've had global pandemics um, and, you know, they, can, they continue to seem to get even um, more and more um, difficult. So here we are today doing virtual astronomy because of a, a global pandemic. Um, so is this just the natural course of evolution um, you know, on all planets that eventually a pandemic wipes out all the intelligent um, uh, creatures? That's certainly uh, something to, to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, the other kinds of things that we are facing as as a as a species is really extinction from natural events, things that occur that um, that we really haven't had control over. And so, one of the things is is global warming. Now, there is a control factor that mankind does play in this, but our Earth, geologically, our Earth has had events of warming and cooling in its geologic path past. Now. The picture that you see here is, is really a simulation of what the surface of Venus might look like. And a number of years ago, uh, NASA sp sent space probes, uh, a space probe called Magellan to actually look at the surface of Venus and try to understand what is Venus all about. And they found out that Venus is a super hot world. 
Um, it's, uh, the average temperature is somewhere between 800 to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. That is hot enough to have to melt lead and they actually have, have uh, discovered rivers of molten lead on the planet. Uh, plus two, uh, their greenhouse gas cycle has actually changed from producing water over into producing hy uh, hydrochloric acid. So the rain that they have is literally battery acid that's raining down on the planet. And this makes the planet very hot. The atmosphere is about, uh, about 90 bars. Any spacecraft that lands on the planet actually literally disintegrates within about uh, five to six hours. With all the spacecraft that have landed on there have literally disintegrated not just a few hours before they've landed because the pressure is so great, the heat's so great, you just can't make a spacecraft that will actually land on that surface to survive. So that was alarming uh, to NASA, especially as they began to look at the atmosphere and they realized, oh, wait a minute, the greenhouse cycle in, on Venus is exactly like Earth's. Venus has been, been known as or called Earth's twin. It's almost the same size of Earth. And they have a, a greenhouse cycle. And what happened was, for some reason, their greenhouse gas cycle, or greenhouse cycle actually switched over from creating water to creating high, uh, sulfuric acid. And uh, lo and behold, we actually found that the same process is here on Earth. And when you hear the term acid rain, there's a lot of different acids that are actually being generated by our greenhouse cycle. And the concern is that that, that cycle is going to tip over to where it's only generating sulfuric acid. And that would be a very bad thing for Earth that would make life on Earth uh, not livable. We have seen uh, over the years, and literally the studies have really, be really began in the 1980s. Believe it or not, ExxonMobil and Shell Royal actually began these studies in the 70s themselves and began posting the alarm that uh, the introduction of carbon in the atmosphere was going to produce more violent storms. And NASA actually began a study in, 19, in the 1980s and, and corroborated the fact that the, th the same things that ExxonMobil and Shell Royal came up with. So uh, even in this last year, uh, in June, we saw a derecho. This is uh, what we have over here on the left. And a derecho is like a tornado, but you just turn it on its side. And it's, it's super, uh, you know, cyclonic winds, uh, but over a much greater uh, uh, area. And if you look right here in the, this top middle, uh, this is a picture of the corn crop in Iowa. Uh, the Iowa, uh, Iowans lost roughly a third of their corn crop in a little less than three hours as a result of this particular duration that, uh, that occurred um, in June, on June 6th. Um, and then, of course, if you recall last year, we had so many hurricanes that we nearly ran through, through the entire Greek alphabet. Uh, and so storms last year really began intensifying in ways that we had never seen in the past. So this is the first time I believe that we had actually gone through the entire Greek alphabet. So it was really quite scary. Um, if you look at this really nice little river here in my lower left pane, uh, it looks like a kind of a lazy river. It's peaceful and calm, but that's not really a river. That's actually I-40 in 2017 that was... Uh, that the uh, I-40, we, we had Hurricane Florence came through and actually kind of inundated North Carolina. And now it was a slow moving storm. It was a category one storm, supposedly a weak storm in our, in our vernacular, the way that we categorize storms. And we realized, oh, wait a minute, this is very powerful. So this is Eastern North Carolina and this is I-40, right down I-40. So it was a devastating flood. And we've had a few since then. And so uh, I can tell you this was a, it affected me because I was uh, actually, my daughter was getting married on this day and uh, I was actually digging a trench in my yard to drain water of my driveway so wedding guests could come to our house for the wedding. So global warming was affecting me at that point. And of course, we see the ice packs. We know the ice packs are melting and we can see that they're, they're really beginning to, to uh, dis disappear. This causes sea level rise, which gives us actually fuels more energy into storms. Uh, continuing on, uh, this is the actual NASA study that we actually had um, way back in the 1980s. This was a predictor. So 1980 was when it was started. So every, all the data they show here from, from the early 50s, uh, late 50s on was what they knew. And then based on the predictive model of the amount of carbon going into our atmosphere, they could see it was going up. Now these panels on the left really talk about solar irradiation. 
In other words, how much solar activity or energy are we getting naturally? And we see we have some really natural cycle, cycles. Some of those are 100,000 years to 413,000 years in length. So this really talks about how much energy are we getting in the sun, from the sun. And we're kind of at a triple low where all, all these factors are actually uh, going uh, factoring in. However, if we actually look at the data, then this is the bottom, the bottom line, we would actually be cooler than we are today. And so I want to kind of fast forward to the day and so here's on the left, this is our prediction. This is the prediction that NASA made. And on the right is the actual data. This was actually a 2020 program, uh, 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 sorry, I should say a, a 2020 uh, program on uh, ABC News where they actually showed where the actual temperatures are. And based on solar irradiance, we should be about minus, four, uh, should have only gained about minus, about minus 0.4 degrees C. Okay, we should have been below that. And that would have been about right about right in here, this area right here. But if you look at this top graph, this is what we've contributed to global warming. This is the actual temperature. You can see that we're actually exactly where NASA said we would be. We're roughly two degrees. We've actually gained two degrees in our atmosphere. And this is purely to uh, speaks to our dumping carbon into the atmosphere. So this is a filter for us. This is a great filter that we need to deal with else we're probably going to drive the extinction of our, our species or at least drive our planet into a hot zone like Venus. And we don't want that to happen. That'd be a very bad day for the earth. All right, Mike. Yeah, and also many other uh, factors uh, you know, could cause us to uh, have that filter snuff us out. And one of them is external impacts. And uh, it's not even theoretical. We've actually seen this happen. Um, so what we're showing here is a picture of uh, a comet strike uh, to Jupiter back in, uh, in 1994. Uh, this is Shoemaker-Levy 9, I think. Now I can't remember the mm -hmm. exact number. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. So uh, most astronomers uh, thought, oh, you know what? It's going to hit Jupiter and everything will be fine. Um, and it just so happens that when the comet struck Jupiter, um, it, uh, we could no longer see it. Jupiter had rotated out of our field of view. And so we had to wait for Jupiter to, to come back um, uh, in, in to uh, finish rotating. And everyone was astonished. Um, you had these, in essence, this, this, uh, you know, this comet that had broken up uh, and just gave Jupiter a series of black eyes and each one of those um, little dimples or, or black areas that you can see are uh, greater or larger than the size of the earth uh, and this was not a particularly large comet um, when you think about it so um, you know and again the expectation was that it would just be absorbed into Saturn and nothing or to Jupiter and nothing would happen so um, comets can be a, uh, a deadly filter for us. Uh, and we know that it's not just a matter of um, if it can happen, it's a matter of when. So this is a particular view of the Chicxulub crater um, that hit the Yucatan Peninsula, which is thought to have wiped out the dinosaurs. Um, and you can see the actual uh, uh, crater that can still be found today or, or remnants of that crater um, uh, impact. So again, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And I love this one. Um, this is, uh, I can never say the actual real name. So we just call it Comet uh, you know, uh, 67P. Um, but this is a great view. Uh, this was uh, one of the uh, comets that uh, ESA had sent a lander to. Um, uh, but this is its representation of the size of that comet uh, sitting next to an urban uh, Earth location. So you can imagine if something, even though it's not particularly dense, uh, but how fast it's moving. If something that large were to enter our atmosphere uh, and potentially make an impact, it would be a very, very bad day for Earth. All right. So uh, as Mike said, that would be very bad. You can't nuke something like that. Uh, we do have to develop technology that would actually, um, um, you know, uh, save the earth from an impact like that. So, um, so the other question though is, is that is what if? What if um, there's something out there that we shouldn't discover? 
what if the, you know, I, I put up a few things out here. This is the, over here on the left, this is the planet killer from, uh, from uh, Star Trek, the old Star Trek series. Um, and over here is the Borg from the Next Generation series that came along. You know, what if there are things out there that we shouldn't discover that actually, if we, if we did discover them, that would alert them to our existence and they'd come for us. They want to, maybe they would see our planet as, as something to consume for their own energy purposes. I mean, we're certainly looking at asteroids right now that have, that are rich in metals and stuff like that. And we're thinking, hey, if we would go there and mine those instead of mining the earth, we could A, save a lot of issues with pollution on our earth, but we'd also get a lot of, of free metals that are just floating around out there. Some of the asteroids are actually comprised almost entirely of gold. So it's, it's really quite a, quite a, literally a gold mine out there in the asteroid belt. But again, something like that could be coming for us. So we might not want to discover something. There's some, some intelligent life that we don't want to discover. Uh, if uh, Twilight Zone fans from the early 60s, there was a great uh, program called To Serve Man. And aliens actually had discovered the Earth, came to Earth, and we were, they were taking us for rides to their planet, but it was kind of a one-way ride because they, they love to serve man for, for food. So uh, that's, that's always a possibility. Um, but then again, let's think about something else. What if we are actually the first? What if we're the first life to actually emerge, emerge from, from a water world onto dry land? What if we're the first ones to develop technologies? So like we have locomotive technologies, we have flight. Of course, we have space flight where we finally actually made it off the planet and left our footprint on moon, on our moon, which is another world. But also, you know, think about this, you know, also what goes along with that? You know, the, the intimacy of, of love. Uh, between a parent and a child or between lovers and, and, the, and the family structure that we have developed as, as, as a people is certainly something that's, that's rare, even in the, uh, sometimes even in some of the species that we see in the animal kingdoms and stuff like that. And then, you know, we have the vaccines here at the, this kind of bottom center panel, you know, that kind of represents our capacity to care for others that we don't even know. We develop these things so that we can preserve our species. So what if we're the first? Don't you think that it maybe it behooves us to maybe preserve our species by creating maybe a space pairing, pairing uh, population that makes goes to other planets or possibly one that actually seeks to preserve our planet? Now, I want to take just a, a brief moment and get you guys to kind of think about and look back towards our Earth. So if you look at this picture, you'll see the arrow that I have sitting here is pointing to a tiny little dot. Now in this picture, if you guys know anything about pictures, a pixel is the one, the single unit that you use to represent um, something on a picture. It's the smallest unit you can, be, can have. So this picture is only one pixel wide, this little dot you see here. And we called it the pale blue dot. And what that dot is, is that on February 14, 1990, as the Voyager 1 spacecraft was leaving, it had passed, Jupe, uh, passed Pluto. And as it was leaving our solar system, uh, NASA scientists had it turn around and take a picture of Earth. And that's us. When you're looking at that little dot suspended in a sunbeam there, you're looking at us. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it is everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives there that contains the total sum of our joy and suffering and thousands of confident religions, ideologies, economic doctrines, every hunter, forager, hero, coward, creator, destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, and every young a couple in love, every mother, father, hopeful child, inventor, explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and every sinner in our history of our species lived there on that little moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. You know, the earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. 
Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this little pixel down here to the inhabitants of another corner. How frequent their misunderstandings and how eager they are to kill one another over their fervent hatreds. You know, the earth is the only world that we know to date to harbor life. There's nowhere else, at least for the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes, settle, nah, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. It's been said in astronomy that astronomy is a humbling and character building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish this pale blue dot. It's the only home we've ever known. So I, I submit to you, it's our responsibility to preserve our species, to preserve one another and to treat each other in a kind way so that we will filter ourselves out of existence. All right, thank you very much. That's the end of our talk. And we'll take any questions that people have now. That was so great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. All right. So we did have a bunch of wonderful questions. Um, and the first one I wanted to point out was Matthew at the very beginning of the program was talking about the Goldilocks zone and how aliens had to be in a similar Goldilocks zone um, with like the perfect water, land conditions, everything like that. So I wanted to point that out. Thank you for mentioning that, Matthew. Um, we had a couple of people wondering when you were talking about the types of um, the civilizations where you can like, you know, harness the power of your own planet versus like the star versus the galaxy. Um, yeah. You said, you mentioned that we were very close to one, but not quite there. Do you have like an yeah. estimate of exactly like to the 10th, how, how yeah. close we are? Exactly. Well, you know, I think that uh, that's called the Kardashev uh, rule mm -hmm. and you can actually look that up online. But according to the speculations, well, they think we're about 0.76. Now, quite right. frankly, I, I kind of look at that. And I think that's even that is a bit... Um, Ambitious. <laughs> yeah, we're zealous, exactly. I, we might be more like about, about 0.26. We really have not really been able to harness all of the all of the energy of our planet. And we've also proven that when we do, we actually have a tendency to mess it up. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, some really good examples are like geothermal power. Uh, so Greenland uh, actually harnessed all, or maybe it was Iceland, harnessed all their all of their geothermal power, which was really fantastic. But in so doing, they actually destroyed all the important microbial life that lived in some of those volcanic pools and vents that they had. And we've now found out that all that bacterium was super useful for things like DNA testing and stuff like that. So we've actually kept that in Yellowstone. That's why Yellowstone has not been developed because the microbial life there is super beneficial to actually enabling our, our technology. So... Yes. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Mike. You have a comment on that no, one? No, well? yeah. I, same thing. It's uh, like I said, I think that point, point 0.7 is a, a bit uh, overzealous. Yeah. Uh, and just Still think have about a lot to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Think about how much sunlight actually hits the earth, and that would be considered you'd have to harness all of that, and we're nowhere even close. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, we had a question um, talking about because of the distance we are from many planets, wouldn't an advanced civilization on another planet or in another galaxy need the ability to travel faster than light? I think that's a, a good, definitely a good question. Um, the answer would be possibly, um, or if, again, depending upon what their uh, lifespan is, would they be in generational ships or yeah. probably more realistic? would they be sending out robot probes? Yeah. Um, but, but yes, you'd have to figure out a way uh, to efficiently do it. You'd have to travel faster than light. Um, and again, we know you can't do that. You can't actually travel the speed of light. So you'd have to figure out whether it's you know, a warp-like -like technology, uh, which again, all those things are just advanced um, engineering. Right. Yeah, exactly. We're yeah, and Anne actually mentioned also having generation ships as well. Yeah, like yeah. you said. Exactly. Yeah. Um, um, do you have an yeah. estimate on how long till we send missions to systems that likely support life? So I think that's uh, the question is really uh, twofold. It's, um, you know, we could send missions now that are robotic, um, but it would, you would have, people would have to make the investment now 
uh, knowing that that would not be even something that would be able to be returned to us uh, mm -hmm. in our own lifetime. So mm -hmm. you know, you'd have to have people willing to say, yes, we're going to do this for the benefit of, you know, six or seven generations ahead of us. Um, and that would just be robotic. Uh, as far as actual missions of, of people, again, that would require with our own technology today, uh, generational ships. Um, and it would just take you know, thousands upon thousands of years uh, yeah. to get to even, uh, you know, the next closest planet. No, unfortunately, and we I, are very far away. And I want to add to, to Mike's question. If you remember the Drake equation that Mike showed, one of the last um, uh, terms in that equation was, was how long does a civilization last? So let's say that we there's a even let's say, you know, even 100 light years away, we find a, a civilization and we, we build a general a generational uh, spaceship and we send it there. But all of a sudden that uh, that. Uh, society is wiped out by their own pandemic, or possibly, um, let's say their star goes supernova and they're blown away. Uh, all of a sudden our ship arrives there, you know, thousands of years later with people ready to disembark and, and live a new life and there's no planet there. Or the, or the society, or the, the world has become, you know, dead and uninhabitable. So th there's a lot of problems that this, this does uh, present to us, a lot of challenges. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, lots of filters that we've got to... Mm -hmm. A lot of filters there. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So unfortunately, we are running out of time. So I have to do my last concluding. Um, but thank you all so much for attending. And thank you so much to Mike and Doug for presenting today. Uh, we got a lot of mentions in the chat. That was a beautiful speech at the end. And I agree. Oh, so thank, thank you very all. much for doing that one. Um, and I wanted to thank our sponsor, the North Carolina Space Grant, as well as our members of the museum who helped make Astronomy Days happen. So thank you all so much. If you would like to join our museum membership, the link is at the bottom of the slide there. It's naturalsciences.org slash membership. And if you join, you'll save 10% on the t-shirt and the hoodie that you see there. And then you can also receive other discounts and access to members only events and other things as well. Um, and the, today is our last day of astronomy days and I'm really sad about it, but there are still great programs that are going to be happening throughout the day. So um, we'll paste the link in chat for how to register for those programs for the rest of the day. And uh, we would also love to hear your feedback on how we can improve our programming. So we'll paste the link to our survey in the chat and we'll also email email it out to you if you registered for this program. Yeah. Um, so if you would fill that out, we would very greatly appreciate that. And finally, since this program was recorded, we are um, putting it on our Astronomy Days program page, um, as well as our YouTube play playlist on YouTube. So um, check that out if you wanted to uh, revisit any fun facts about the Drake Paradox or <laughs> things like that yeah. that, we, hey. that we mentioned today. Hey, Sam, it's Doug. I just want to interject really quick yes. that that final speech was actually written by Carl Sagan. Yep. And that's what he thought about when he actually saw that pale blue dot. So I'm not taking credit what for that. It's actually uh, Carl Sagan. So yeah, yeah. Thank wise you very much. From him. Yes, you all. we appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And thank you all so much for attending. And we hope you have a great last day of Astronomy Days. Yep. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>